Yeah, it's really nice for me to actually have met so many of you last night, and um, I think some of which I will cover today. We've probably spoken about individually um, uh, last night as well. So, but yeah, I want to talk to you really about Project Seagrass, the journey of setting up the uh, environmental NGO, um, some of the science and the sort of background to that, and some of the work that we do. Um, and there's a strong focus on the work that we do in restoring ecosystems. So one of the um, it, one of the, I guess, big drives at the moment in the world is to restore nature. Um, and in the marine space, um, we're probably 10 or 15 years behind a lot of the work that's being done on land. There's so much we still need to learn. Um, and fortunately for us, working in, in this space, uh, the UN has declared two decades. So UNESCO has declared uh, the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And the United Nations Environmental Programme and the Food and Agricultural Organization combined have declared the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And that's a rallying cry. That's a, that's a call to say, we need to put nature back, we need to put ecosystems back, and fundamentally we need to restore our world. So, you know, as individuals, we can't do everything. So I'm, I'm wearing a, a, a seagrass hat today, really. Um, but the title of the talk is Becoming Generation Restoration, which is the, the hashtag for the UN Decade. I think it's the first UN Decade with any sort of social media presence. Um, but becoming generation restoration, and it goes from underwater gardening to seascape restoration. And really that's a reflection on two things. One is when we first started out looking to see if we could restore habitat, we were doing it at a very small scale, trial and error, doing scientific studies to see if we could optimise the way that we can restore seagrass meadows. Today we've started restoring seagrasses at much larger scales. Um, but the, 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 the narrative or the movement really is can we restore seascapes? Because as much as we want to put seagrass back, seagrasses alone aren't going to solve the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. We need to be thinking about how habitats are intertwined and, and, uh, and how they're connected in the seascape. Which means we need to be thinking about seagrass meadows beside kelp forests, beside coral reefs, beside oyster reefs. And it's that connectivity which, which is what, mate, na what makes nature thrive. So. This is a broad structure to the talk. Who, where, what, why, how. What is seagrass? I think I always, I always start with this because for many people they've never heard of seagrass and they won't realise it's a marine plant. Um, where is seagrass found or where are seagrasses found? Why should we care about seagrass? You know, 10 years ago I'd, ne I'd never heard of what seagrass was or maybe 12 years ago now. I didn't know about seagrass. But the more I learn about this plant and the, 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 or these, this group of plants, uh, the more I'm inspired by what they do for us. And so a bit of a, a Seagrass 101, I guess. And then just a bit of reflection on who Project Seagrass are. So who are we as an organization? How did we come about? And what kind of work do we do? So as a, as a marine scientist or a, a, a plant scientist, um, what is the ideal on a day-to-day -day basis? What does that work look like? And this really is just a visual. So seagrass to seascape. When we did our first seagrass restoration project in Dale in 2019, we put basically a square on a map, two hectares, so 20,000 square meters, and we said we're gonna plant a seagrass meadow there. And there was a lot more to it than that. We needed to look at the environmental conditions were suitable, but fundamentally we chose our, our field underwater and we said we're gonna plant seagrass there. And during that process, you know, we were really excited by the fact that we were able to start putting nature back and starting to restore these habitats. But over those two years, we were asking ourselves the question, but this is a habitat in isolation. The rest of the, the bay down there is barren, so it's just mud and sand on the seafloor. And we know that seagrass meadows are important for juvenile fish, that's where young fish live. But if the seagrass is in isolation, and it's not connected to the salt marsh, or it's not connected to the reefs, then those bait juvenile fish will grow up and they'll have nowhere to go to. And so that's when we started reaching out to colleagues and say, we need to be more ambitious in this space. We can, or well, we're developing the techniques and the skills and the science to be able to do seagrass restoration. But if we're gonna make this meaningful for nature, we need to be working with you guys to make sure that oysters are back where they should be, the kelp is back where they should be. And so what we see today, and what I'm gonna to touch on towards the end of the talk, is this real movement towards restoring our seascapes. There we go. Okay, so seagrass. Seagrasses are marine angiosperms, so they're flowering plants, and they're found on every continent in the world except Antarctica. 
In terms of um, global biodiversity, the, the bulk of the biodiversity and the number of species we find is down here in the Indo-Pacific. Um, this area of the world just here, and just above Australia, is known as the Coral Triangle, and it's famous for its marine biodiversity. And in the seagrasses, that area of the world, there's no exception. Really, really high levels of um, both genetic and species diversity. And it's kind of driven by the fact you've got the Pacific Ocean, you've got the Indian Ocean, and then you've got the Southern Ocean. And the currents that move through Indonesia um, are bringing with them uh, colder waters, warmer waters, and species from all over, the, all over the, um, that sort of part of the region of the world. So really, really high levels of biodiversity down in this space. Now, where we are up in Europe, we only have two species of seagrass. Um, one's called eelgrass, um, or zoster mariner, and one's called uh, dwarf eelgrass, or zoster nalti. Um, and so of the 72 different species globally, depending on which scientist you speak to, 70 species globally, um, we only have these two. So a relatively low diverse, uh, diverse region, I guess. Um, and some of the other work that we're doing at the moment is actually looking at the genetic diversity within those species. The thing that amazes me, though, about the species of plants that we have here, is Ostermarina, is their plasticity. So the plant is found all the way up here in the high Arctic, all the way down here on the west coast of Africa, and it's circumglobal. So as a plant, it is colonized, or it now exists in a huge range all the way around the world. And some of the work that we're doing as scientists, uh, marine scientists, is looking at, well, what are the what scientists refer to as ecosystem services, but what are the benefits of this habitat in all those different latitudes? So, for example, last week I was up in Orkney, and the Orkney Isles are just off the north coast of Scotland there, uh, and we're mapping seagrass meadows up there, and we're finding out what species of animals are living in these seagrass meadows. Um, but the water temperature up there is disconcertingly warm at the moment, but still relatively cold as compared to some of the meadows that we work with in Cornwall on the Isle of Wight. And so what we're seeing is the habitat that's created, even though it's the same plant, the species that are living in that habitat are different. So species like the Atlantic cod, famous for fish and chips on a Friday, we see a lot more of those up in the, in the Orkneys, whereas down in the Isle of Wight, we might be seeing a lot more well, increasingly Mediterranean species, cuttlefish, sea bream. And so understanding that these habitats have different roles to play at different latitudes is a big part of the work that we're doing. When most people go to the sea and they walk along the beach and you see green or brown stuff washed up, or if you were able to go for a snorkel in the shallow coastal zone, most of the time you are seeing marine algae, macroalgae. So kelps, for example, will have a, a blade and they'll have a stipe, which is attaches to a holdfast, and that holdfast attaches to a hard substrate, usually rock. So in a, in a coastal zone down by the beach, if you were to swim out, if you're seeing lots of kelps, they're generally attaching to the, to, to the bedrock um, just below the surface. Seagrasses are different. Seagrasses are plants that evolved on land and returned to the sea. And so they're bringing with them flowers, leaves, roots, rhizomes, and seeds. And so it's actually that might, what might seem like a, a relatively insignificant difference has a huge impact on the bays in which they're found. If you can imagine, like perhaps like you've been doing this week, with, there's some plants in this room some of you brought in. If you were to pull a plant out of the ground in the garden, you often find the sediment is bound into, the, into that root system. It's holding it together. And exactly the same phenomenon is happening on the sea floor. That root system is binding that sediment together. Now, what that means is these seagrass meadows help hold the seafloor in place. So it helps pre prevent resuspension of sediment and silt. So what we tend to find is the water above seagrass meadows is crystal clear because all that sediment's being bound down. We also find that um, this as I'll talk about in a second, is where a lot of carbon burial takes place. So I'll talk in a, in a second about how these meadows are being increasingly recognized for their ability to sequester carbon and store it over long time periods. But essentially, I'm not going to go into too much detail beyond, the, beyond that. Marine angiosperms and plants are what we call ecosystem engineers. They shape the environment in which they're found in a way that macroalgae simply can't do. Blue carbon. We're in, the, we're in the face of a planetary emergency, two or three. Climate crisis is definitely one. Um, I say last week I was up in Orkney. I'd expect water temperatures in Orkney to be around 9 or 10 degrees at this time of year, and we had 14. 
And I know that some of my colleagues who are working in the marine space in this, over this last 10 days have experienced water temperatures six degrees above average. Like this is off the chart. We've never seen this before. And it's deeply concerning. But one of the things that we're all excited about, I guess, in, if we're working in plant sciences, is the capacity for plants to be a huge ally in helping to mitigate the effects of climatic change. Now on land, or maybe this is a term that just marine biologists use, we refer to green carbon. And green carbon is the carbon that, if we plant a tree, a lot of that organic carbon is, is actually found in the trunk, it's found in the leaves, it's found in the, the body of the plant. Very little is actually sequestered into the sediment. The excitement around blue carbon is, and if you imagine a, a photo of a, a seagrass meadow, there's very little carbon in the grass itself. You know, it's a very small plant. But the way that marine systems store carbon, and because of that root system we spoke about, when you have the blades sticking up into the, into the water column and you get organic matter deposited between the blades, when that gets, touches the sea floor, the, the grass grows on top of the, the, the sediment and that carbon, organic, organic matter, is buried beneath the sediment. Now, over many, many millennia, that becomes very, very significant and it becomes a very permanent carbon store. So this figure here of seagrasses, seagrasses occupying 0.1% of the sea floor, but accounting for a third of all the carbon sequestered into the seafloor. These are enormous allies in our fight against climatic change. So much so, they've been celebrated in the TED Talk. So I would highly recommend you to um, watch this TED Talk. It focuses particularly on the Mediterranean species, Posidonia, Posidonia oceanica, and its capacity to sequester vast amounts of carbon and lock it away for, for, for many, many millennia. Now, one thing to be aware of is not all seagrasses are created equal. And when we set up, with, when we set up Project Seagrass, the first bit of science communication we needed to do was to say, hey, there is this plant. It's a marine plant. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't exist on land. It's not an algae. Um, and they, they, they create these amazing habitats that are biodiverse and rich, and they sequester carbon. Where we're now at 10 years in is when you start talking to people about, you know, there's more than one type of seagrass, just like there's more than one type of tree. It might seem obvious, but not all seagrasses come in the same sh uh, shape and size. This seagrass here, Posidonia oceanica, um, has a very thick root system, a very thick rhizome mat. And actually, if you go to the Mediterranean uh, and you snorkel out, you can swim down the side of that root system. It may be 10, 20, 30 meters deep in some places. And all of that is organic matter that has built up over many, many millennia. That's carbon locked into that seafloor. On a smaller scale, this is a, this is a photo from the, 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 the Caribbean. This is turtle grass and, and manatee grass. You'll see these, these ledges of um, rhizome. And again, this is just sediment that's being accumulated over time underneath the, uh, the seagrass meadow. The seagrass meadow just slowly grows on top and on top and on top. Being a plant, seagrass meadows need light, and so they're always going to be found in that shallow, sheltered coastal environment. But you can see from this picture, for some of those larger, more robust seagrasses, the amount of carbon that can be accumulated, even over relatively short time periods, is very, very impressive. And so as, a, as an ally in our fight against climate change, a lot of interest in seagrass at the moment. The second big one, and this is, we're seeing increasing interest in this, and recognition, actually, that our problems in nature right now aren't just the climate, it's also biodiversity. Seagrass meadows are havens for biodiversity and they're also massive in supporting our fisheries. About one-fifth of the world's largest fisheries rely on seagrass meadows. So seagrass meadows are known to be nursery grounds for, for commercially important fisheries. So it's where the juvenile fish will grow or the baby fish will grow up. Now just like with, um, I guess just like with people, we need to have nurseries, then we need to have primary schools, we need to have secondary schools, and then on we go. That supply chain needs to be in place. Without oversimplifying it, in the sea, it's the same. We need to have our seagrass meadows for the juvenile fish, but we need to have our kelp forests for primary school. We need to have our offshore reefs for the teenagers, and then eventually those fish can get caught offshore. Without all, all, of, those, all of those elements of the, uh, of the supply chain, without all of those habitats, Juvenile fish will never make it to adulthood, or, much, or many, many fewer will make it to adulthood. So for food security globally, it's a big thing. 
This is just a, an example actually from Orkney. These are juvenile gadids, so commercially important species. You get Atlantic cod, you get pollock. And this photo was taken last summer in a, in a seagrass meadow. Now, the reason why juvenile fish love this, love seagrass, is if you can imagine you're yay big, two or three inches, then a plant that can grow to this high, or maybe even higher in the Orkneys, maybe 1.7 meters, it's a great place to hide. So you can hide in amongst those blades, and any larger fish aren't gonna be able to find you. So you can hide, you can, uh, it's also a plant. And we learn this when we're 14, don't we? I'm sure when we all first learned about food webs and food chains, we had maybe some grass and it was eaten by a rabbit. And then we had um, a fox ate the rabbit. I think I said this yesterday. In the sea, it's the same thing. We've got sea grass, we've even got rabbit fish, and we've got predators, sharks, or whatever, which will eat those larger fish too, seals. So that primary productivity that comes from a plant in that coastal space creates these vast, vibrant food webs, which is what we need for um, real health in the coastal zone. But when we first set out with Project Seagrass, it was very hard to try and make seagrass enticing. And I think we probably all struggle with this in the, in the, in the plant sciences community. How can we get people stoked on plants? And so for us, initially, we started thinking, well, what do people like? Now, people like things like sea cows. This is a dugong. Um, it's relative to the manatee, so, and it's found in the Indo-Pacific. And what it's eating there, this is another species of seagrass. So again, very different from the Posidonia oceanica we've seen, very different from the Zostomarina we have around our, our coasts. These, these holophilas, a bit more like, um, I don't know, Haribo for dugong, right? Car more carbohydrate rich, and these animals will consume vast quantities of this over the course of the day. But Dugong is a charismatic species, and as I'll come on to talk about, we've done some work on seagrasses because people were cared, cared a lot about making sure that dugongs persisted. And it's not just dugongs, we have sea turtles. So the green sea turtle is a vociferous eater of seagrasses. There's actually a, a seagrass named after the turtle called turtle grass. Um, they can eat up to two kilograms a day of seagrasses. So again, if we start losing our seagrasses, we're losing the food for dugongs, we're losing the food for turtles. You may have seen a paper recently um, where some scientists from the States attached a GoPro and some tracking units to, to tiger sharks to help map a, a massive seagrass meadow on the Bahaman Bank. And actually we've done this similar work with, with sea turtles. Animals can be huge allies in our, our, our bid to map seagrass meadows globally because they will go from seagrass meadow to seagrass meadow. For, sea, for turtles, it's because they want to eat the seagrass, and for, for tiger sharks, it's because they want to eat the turtles. But it's the same, the same principle remains, is that we, you know, these, these habitats are being utilized because they are productive, they provide food, and if you're small, they provide shelter. But we should be proud, and we should celebrate the biodiversity we have closer to home. So these next few slides are just some images of some of that complexity and that biodiversity, that, that three-dimensional um, structure that these meadows provide on the sea floor, at, at, well, enable to, to happen. So this is an anemone found on a, a seagrass meadow up in the Bay of Tukwoi in, in Orkney. You get sea slugs, so these are called nudibranch, um, but they are essentially slugs that live in the sea. Uh, and they, lo they love living in seagrass meadows. You get all kinds of little isopods and gastropods. In fact, in the marine space, you get sea snails, you get sea slugs, you get pretty much all, everything you have on land, but they exist in the sea. And again, just like we find in, me in meadows on land, we get that vibrancy um, found in the sea. There's a, a colleague of mine, or someone who we work with over on the west coast of Scotland in Argyll. Um, it's a community group. And they, they've been recently interviewed on a podcast called, I think it's, I think it's called the Rewilding Podcast. And Philip talks about um, some of his, his favorite habitats on land being wildflower meadows. And he talks about going in in like May or June and those meadows being rich with butterflies and buzzing sounds and bees and insects and everything else. And for a long time, he was a terrestrial photographer, worked a lot on land. And he was introduced to seagrass two years ago when they started the restoration project. And he said he gets the same buzz, no, no pun intended, from snorkeling over a seagrass meadow. Being able to just drift, like float over a seagrass meadow and see all that activity, that hum of activity being provided by these habitats. And also, not all marine life in the UK is dull. We get some pretty, pretty beautiful colors too. 
So what is Project Seagrass for? What, what are we about? Well, you've probably seen this graph in, for many different species, but ultimately we're here to try and bend the curve and to save the world's seagrasses. That might seem like a, uh, a lofty ambition, but it's definitely needed. So we published a paper in Science last year, and it was calling on, well, the, it's called the planetary role of seagrass conservation. And ultimately, really what this graph is showing is that where we are right now is globally in a state of free fall with seagrasses. We are losing seagrass ecosystems globally year on year. Around the UK, it's estimated we've lost at least 44%, maybe as much as 92% of our seagrass ecosystems. And that's mainly due to poor water quality. So seagrass meadows needing to exist near the coast in those shallow sheltered environments, we need them to be looking a lot more like that rather than like that. When you get too much nutrient loading, when we get too much eutrophication, we get the algal blooms, it smothers the seagrass, and the seagrass um, disappears. Once you've flipped a system, once you've taken away the plants, then it's very difficult to put them back, as we're discovering with restoration. What we want to see is a global situation where we're no longer losing seagrass, and actually we're on a pathway to net gain. Seagrasses should be everywhere we... everywhere. Seagrasses should exist everywhere they can exist, and that shouldn't be limited by poor water quality. Two years ago, or was it 2018? More than that, five years ago now. Um, global seagrass community meets every two years, and in one of those sessions, one of those discussions, we had to have a discussion around what are the biggest challenges for seagrass conservation? And in this paper, there's a, there's a number listed. But number one was no one's ever heard of seagrass. So seagrass was, has been termed the ugly duckling of marine conservation. And actually one of marine scientists, uh, one of marine scientists most famous sons, uh, Carlos Duarte here, um, coined that term ugly duckling. And the paper he published showed the amount of investment going into coral reef science and into mangrove science, which were up here, and then seagrass science, which was down here. It's just unrecognized as an ecosystem. And given everything that we're learning about seagrasses, this was like, well, it's unacceptable, frankly. So the very first thing that we needed to do was to communicate seagrass. Let's get people stoked and excited about seagrass ecosystems. The second challenge, which uh, is mentioned in this um, paper, is the need to map seagrasses. Now, on land, because of satellite technology, we can go onto Google Earth these days, Google Maps or any mapping software, and we can just scroll around. I'm sure everyone in this room has probably spent some time scrolling around, finding their house, looking at parks, etc. But for everyone in this room, as soon as you get to the coast, it's just blue, right? It's just blue. So we've got no idea about the mosaic of habitats that exist in the coastal zone because we can't see it. It's out of sight, out of mind. The sea is just this big box. And yet we also know, because we've also seen David Attenborough and we've seen all these programs, that actually under the sea there is this vast complexity of life. But we just don't know where it is. So the second big challenge for seagrass conservation is mapping. Let's get some maps, let's get some good maps, just as good as we have on land, so that we know where these seagrass meadows are. I spoke briefly yesterday about Project Seagrass and how we came to be, but this is the, this is the founding team. Rich here was my lecturer at, Project, um, at Swansea University during my master's course. This was 2011. Um, very established, uh, internationally respected natural scientist. So he, if you think of a classic marine biologist measuring the length of fish, doing statistical analyses, that's your man. Leanne, uh, who's actually Rich's wife, is uh, a very well respected social scientist. So she was less concerned about the ecology in, its, in and of itself, but more about how people interacted with these systems. So both Rich and Leanne have spent time out in Indonesia, working with uh, communities in Indonesia. You may have heard of the Bajau people, um, colloquially known as sea gypsies, but the Bajau people are people who spend their entire life, or until recently used to, spend their entire life on the water. So they would never come to land. And in fact, they used to get seasick coming to land. Um, now, in Indonesia, with some of the communities where they were working, there's a very, very strong link between the health of that coastal habitat and food security in a way that we just don't get in the UK. If we, and what this, this actually is what we see, if we have issues with our supply chains, and we saw that through, through COVID, if we have issues in, through our, in our supply chains, we just bring a different white fish in plastic packaging. 
we just source our food from elsewhere. But if you're a community that relies entirely on the health of the, the coral reef or the seagrass meadow adjacent to where you live, and either one of those goes, you lose your dietary protein. So some, some of these communities, 100%, their entire dietary protein is linked to that seagrass meadow and what they're extracting from that seagrass meadow. That plant goes, so does their dietary protein. Ben, uh, Ben was undergraduate when we set up Project Seagrass, it was in his final year. So two years from where you guys are now. Um, and we used to teach together at the, the dive club. I'd been working over in uh, Indonesia, or no, Thailand, as a, as a diver. In fact, here you go. I'd been working over here on the west coast of Thailand as a, a diving instructor. Richard and Leanne had done their, their theses, their PhDs in Indonesia. And they'd gone from there to work in Australia. Now, the, in Australia, seagrass science is advanced. There are multiple labs doing incredible work on seagrasses. Not just seagrasses, but if you can imagine if you've got an asset as impressive as the Great Barrier Reef, marine science is taken very seriously in Australia. So for Rich and Leanne, spending plenty of time working in Queensland and then being faced with coming back to the UK in 2010 to be being told that seagrasses may do all those great things in Australia, but they don't do them here, was a big shock to the system and something that they wanted to address. So this is what I used to look like. This is what my colleague, it looks like he's just come out of prison, looks like, used to look like. Uh, and this is Rich. But this is where we met, Swansea University. And um, I think I said this yesterday again, but I think it was, it was a brave move uh, or a bold move on, on behalf of Rich to be approached by two students, one a postgrad and, and one an undergraduate, with, with this idea of, I think we should set up an NGO. Uh, but he, he'd also identified this need to raise the profile of seagrass ecosystems. And just like I said yesterday, I think one of the best things that's um, come out of our working relationship over the, this last decade is we all respect each other's strengths. You know, there's, we, there, we've all got skills that the other per person can't do, but together that teamwork has enabled us to, I think, create a very ex exciting and successful NGO. And you've got to start somewhere. So whilst we may be working with the UN now, as a supporting partner to the UN Decade. We have projects in the UK, we have projects overseas. That was my student flat in Swansea. And so our mail used to get, go through that letterbox just there. We've got to start somewhere. Patience is an absolute virtue when it comes to following your passion. It's not gonna happen overnight. But if, it's, if, it's, if you identify what you want to do, and it's something you believe in and you work on it, then eventually momentum will build and you'll get there. £500 was our first grant. And if you see here, there's a lot of things that we were borrowing from Swansea University. We knew what we wanted to do, but the grant was for £500. And so we begged, borrowed, and asked very nicely to borrow stuff to try and make this happen. And actually, we've, we, still, we still do this work in, uh, in Porth Decline in North Wales. So a decade later, I think that's probably bang for buck, some of the best money that organisations ever spent. But as a whistle-stop tour, it was just to say, look, you've got to start somewhere and you slowly get, as you work, and, you, and you, it's, about, it's about persistence, you can start um, moving your, your idea forward. So we started you know, just doing work on the ground, really, in Wales, um, engaging communities, school groups, and thankfully, someone somewhere saw, saw the value in that and what we were trying to achieve. And we got shortlisted for a People's Project Award. Now, because we were shortlisted, the great thing is we had ITV come down and then they filmed us and they took some photos and then suddenly we started looking a little bit more professional than what we'd, um, what we'd been looking like previously. But the nice thing is we were being recognised for the work that we were doing and other people were saying, actually, what you are doing is important too. Global recognition came pretty thick and fast. In early in 2015, we applied to the World Seagrass Association to say we'd like to host a, um, the International Seagrass Biology Workshop, the, basically the big seagrass conference in the UK. And we want to, ho we want to host it on this cliff venue in Wales. Um, and that was incredible for us because, as I say, the UK no, had never been hosted in the UK before. The UK had no, shown no real interest in seagrasses as a... As a, as a country in terms, of, in terms of the, I guess, academically. And yet all the world's global experts on seagrass were, were sending on the UK. 
And for us, it was kind of a little bit of a vindication as well, because for a, for a while, and it's only been two years at this point, we felt we were like, no, seagrasses are important. And everyone would be like, yeah, they are. Seagrasses are important. No, 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 they are. But suddenly when you've got people flying in from all over the world, from the States, from Australia, um, you know, across Europe, um, across Asia, coming to talk about seagrasses in a small wedding venue in North Wales, suddenly we began to be taken more serious, seriously domestically. And so that was a big change for us. And actually through that and through networking, we, uh, at, that, at that conference, um, the UN, we became part of a UN project. And this was the project I mentioned earlier. There's a, the Dugong, the Convention of Migratory Species, based out of Abu Dhabi, um, wanted to effect, effect conservation action for the Dugong. And one of the things that is immediately apparent when you're trying to conserve any animal is you need to think about the habitat that animal lives in. And so even though the focus and the funding was for protecting the Dugong, what that actually came down to is protecting the seagrass meadows. And so immediately we were called in to, uh, to start working on that project. And that was great, again, because it started giving us that international exposure, those international networks. And we started to think about, we started to dream big. And I guess the dream had always been there, but we thought what we're doing here is pretty special, I think. Um, and we developed a, a smartphone app. So again, I don't know how to make a smartphone app, but if you find someone who does and you've got an idea, then um, you can, well, again, through, through kind efforts and um, persuasion, I guess, for, for friends and family, um, we've been able to start, start with this, uh, this app. Now, we started the, the app in 2016, and it was just simply a, it's a smartphone app. You should all download it. It's available on Google Play and, and App Store. Um, but it's simply a, an app where if you're walking on, along the beach at low tide, you can take a photo on your phone and upload that photo to us, and it, it turns up on the map. Or if you're a diver or a scuba diver or swimmer or wild swimmer or whatever, and you see seagrass and you take a photo on a GoPro or whatever, you, may, you can upload it to the site. This data is becoming critically important globally now because what, with satellite uh, imagery, we're then able to what we call ground truth it. So we're able to see that the dark patch in the, in the sea is seagrass. And so from that, we're able to build, start to build out global maps using satellite data. But this was a big thing for us because it allowed us to get citizens, people to participate and to really add value to the project that we were doing. A massive inflection point for us, and that's what sent us on the journey we're, we're going to talk about shortly, is restoration. One of the things that we've seen over those last six or seven years is there should be a lot more seagrass around the UK than there, than there was. Um, and so in 2019, with Swansea University, uh, funded by Sky TV, or Sky Ocean Rescue as it was at the time, um, and in collaboration with WFUK, we launched the UK's first meadow scale seagrass restoration project. So two hectares is about 20,000 square meters. Um, and simply what we do is we take seagrass seeds and we plant them. So it's not, it's not rocket science, but you've got to, you've got to there's a, well, I guess there's a little bit more to it than that. But the principle is that seagrass, seagrasses produce seeds in pods. We take those pods, we separate the seeds out, we plant the seeds and seagrass grows. We do need to decide where to plant those, um, those seeds though and make sure there aren't any pressures that are just going to cause the plant to die. And so this is when we went, well, we decided to go really big. We felt, and we still feel actually, that we are really, as an organisation and as a country, tinkering around the edges when it comes to nature conservation. You know, we've moved on a long way from 10 years ago when we were underwater gardening. But if I think of the scale of ambition that we require in terms of nature recovery, we are nowhere near. And so halfway through that first project, we were like, we need to do more of this. We need to get better at this and we need to scale up. So we can't be artisanal underwater gardening. We can't do five or 10 meters squared here and there. We need to be thinking about kilometers squared of, of seagrass restored. And so this was our, our vision. You know, phase one was that pilot. Does it work? Can we do it at scale? This is where we are now. Um, to, with, the plan was to scope further UK sites for, for restoration. We've got a, a 10 hectare project currently ongoing in North Wales, but we're also now working in the Solent in England. We've got a project in Essex, and we've got a four hectare project up in the Firth of Forth. And it was really important as well to do projects in England, Wales, and Scotland, because with three different governments and three different regulators, we needed to make sure that the, 
the sort of normalization of restoration as a philosophy was happening across the UK. And we're hopeful that by 2026 we'll have a progressive government that it was going to advocate for large-scale restoration and help us to coordinate some of this stuff. So that's the vision. But what does that look like? What do I do? Now, obviously that's me, and that's, uh, that's Rich, and this is, our, this is our survey drone. And one of, like I said, one of the first challenges is, where are these habitats? And so what I've been doing for the last two weeks in Orkney is, is exactly this. We take that drone up, we fly it out over the coastal zone, and if there's something that looks like seagrass, I stick on my, my scuba gear, or I stick on just my, uh, my freediving gear, and I swim out and I check if it is indeed seagrass. So this is an example from Orkney. This is a bay where the government's got this data. It's got a GPS point, there's some seagrass under there. A GPS point, there's some seagrass under there. How big government? No idea. Can you go and find out? Yep. Um, and so we're, what we're able to do is look at historic data from the government. We're able to look at data that comes in from Seagrass Spotter, from that smartphone app. And then we'll be able to link the two. So we can see here, this, this picture and this picture here is the same part of the coast. Someone's been along there snorkeling and uploaded photos from the seagrass, and that's also this part here. What we do is we stick the drone up, fly it backwards and forwards, get a very high resolution map, and we're able to start then mapping where those seagrass meadows are around the coast. And so all that data, once we create it, we then send to the government, and at least they've got an idea then, and the, and the local council and the nature agencies of where these habitats are. One of the challenges we've got in the marine space at the moment is there's vast amounts of construction and if it's not in the national data sets, it doesn't exist. So we need to show that it's there so that people can take account of that when they're building. Quick one-on-one, on, I guess, on the restoration process. Over the next, well, it started already in the south of England, in Isle of Wight. In the Isle of Wight, in meadows around the Isle of Wight now, you'll see seas looking like this. And seagrass meadows, um, the, these are called a reproductive shoot. And the, what we're looking to do is collect millions of these seagrass seeds for planting. Seagrass is an our selected species, was often married as an our selected species, in the sense that it will produce high volumes of seed on the, on the expectation that one or two might become a new plant. And so all we're looking really to do is to get as many of those seeds as possible to the optimal depth of between two to four centimetres into the seabed and get them germinating. So in nature, a lot of those seeds would, would be lost. They might fall down into the meadow and be outcompeted by the by the adult plants. They might be swept away into the current, into the deep ocean, never to be seen again. All we're doing is just as they're about to drop off, we take them and we bury them. And so we're maximizing the number of seeds that are at the optimal depth to grow in the place where they're likely to grow. And one of the things that we're trying to do desperately is get more people involved. And so democratizing the restoration process and encouraging other people to do this means using some probably unconventional or innovative techniques. This is essentially a caravan chassis, which we put a shed on top, and inside we've created some processing units for, this is Lyle, who works on Restoration Forth with, with, with us, so he's working on the seagrass restoration in the Firth of Forth. The seagrass goes in the top, salt water is put in, we bubble, we bubble the, uh, the water to keep it aerated, and the seeds drop out the bottom. And so what we're enabling community groups to do is to, to pick their own seagrass, to process their own seeds, and to plant their own seeds. And there's one, one way of scaling is through tech, underwater lawnmowers and seagrass nurseries. But the other is just giving people the skills and opportunity to do this for themselves. And there is so much interest in restoring nature in this country right now that we've got hundreds of people all the time, every summer, looking to get involved. And then ultimately, it's about planting that seagrass. This is uh, in Loch Craignish. This is um, a guy called Will Gowdy. And he's planting a little hessian bag full of seagrass seeds. The idea is that the hessian bag in the sea biodegrades, um, the seagrass grows through the top of the, the bag and the uh, roots grow out the bottom. Why do we put in a hessian bag? Because if we don't, the crabs eat the seeds. So what that does is it gives the plant enough time to germinate and to become big enough so that it doesn't, um, doesn't get consumed um, as a seedling. And that's what it looks like the next year. Little seedlings, little seeds of hope growing out those hessian bags. Now this also, again, looks like a little bit DIY. This is a method developed in the Netherlands. That is a corking gun. So if you're ever corking a bathroom or a wherever you end up corking. But basically what we do is we put a muddy mix with seeds in there and it's been designed to inject to just the right depth 
again, two to four centimeters into the sediment. Whilst this is a more appropriate method for subtidal restoration, we're finding that this is certainly more um, appropriate method for intertidal restoration. And so we're looking to restore, I say, 40,000 square meters of this seagrass in the Firth of Forth over the next two years. Now, four hectares, we think is ambitious. The Dutch in the Wadden Sea over the last five years have restored 650 hectares. So you can see that although we think we're being ambitious, in the global context, we're just scratching the surface. And it's that kind of level of restoration where you can see seagrass on what was otherwise bare mud flats all the way to the horizon, is that the, that's the space we need to be looking at over the next few years. So whilst there's that need to scale, there's also that need to scale with others. And if I was going to sort of broadly, broad brush the sort of state of science for, for restoration in the marine space in the UK right now, I'd say we're getting better at seagrass restoration. I'd say we're pretty good with salt marsh restoration. Native oysters, um, some issues with supply chains, but we're getting there. And we're learning with kelp. There's, not obviously, more, there's obviously more than four different habitats in our coastal space, but those are the ones that we're working on. And last Christmas, 12th of December, we've launched the UK's first seascape project. So we're working obviously on the seagrass, but we're working with other NGOs, we're working with the harbour, we're working with the local government to restore um, the coastal space across the Solent estuary. And since then, we've also started, there's a, a project in the Humber, which is also looking to do the same. The direction of travel is positive, the direction of travel is holistic, and hopefully what we'll see over the next few years is massive recovery of our coastal, coastal zones. So what it comes back to is seagrass to seascape. Whichever career you go into, you're gonna have a specialism which allows you to contribute to your bit. But over the next, well, it'll be for the rest of my life and the rest of your life, we're gonna be working towards nature recovery if we want to live on this planet. And so it's about working with others, it's about networking, it's about collaboration, it's about understanding what you can do and where your work fits into that big picture. So no matter what you end up doing, that there's going to be a need at, at times to reach out and to say, look, what is the big picture here and what is it that we're all working towards? One of the things that is really important to me in my work, and has always been really important to me, I guess, is I did my, my master's and I did my PhD and I, I developed my scientific skills. And I felt I needed to share those skills. And this is the teacher in me, I guess. But it's all in good um, knowing a lot about something if it's just you that knows about it and you're not sharing that knowledge with others, then it can, can kind of be a little bit redundant. And so that image I showed you of the, the seagrass processing caravan is a community group here on the north side of the Firth of Forth and where they're looking to restore seagrass is in this bay here. The community here is completely behind the project. They're pumped, they're stoked to be able to do this. But if I hadn't shared that knowledge with them, then they couldn't be participating. And so I think one of the that one of the responsibilities on all of us in academia is to communicate our science. And it's not something we're always very good at, but I think that over the last 10 years, my journey through Project Seagrass has taught me that communication is, well, basically my job's not finished until it's been communicated. And I don't just mean in scientific papers. Collaboration is key, working with others is key, and communication is key. We spent a lot of time building a brand, I guess, around Project Seagrass. So that we're not just scientists, but we're Project Seagrass, the NGO. And so we have spent a lot of time cultivating and networking and getting relationships that allows us to have a much larger voice in this space than we would otherwise have. So working with big corporates like Carlsberg, when you get Carlsberg creating adverts, I don't know if you've seen the seal and the Seagrass advert, it's one of the most successful adverts ever you're reaching new audiences, audiences that I wouldn't normally be speaking to. You've got an audience at the heart, that hard time at the football game. Our patrons are Coldplay. And so Coldplay, when they tweet, they reach a lot more people than I do. Working with the UN gives us huge global traction. And just being willing to put yourself out there and try making films, be recorded on podcasts, be willing to talk about the work that you do is gonna be so, so, so important. I'm not, I shouldn't say this, I'm, I've never been a massive Coldplay fan. Um, but 
one of the things, that is, they've been amazing to work with. Um, they've obviously got this massive tour on at the moment. Um, and in the stadium before every show, they show our video and they show the work that we're doing on Seagrass Ecosystems. I couldn't believe that collaboration coming around and the impact it's been enabled us to have. But in terms of giving exposure to our science, it's been absolutely enormous. I get WhatsApps and LinkedIn and everything from people across the world who are like, I'm at the Coldplay show and I see Project Seagrass. Think outside the box. And I think the, the other element here, we've always wanted our work to mean something. It's, it's got to have a positive impact for, for, for people and planet. And the term I've used is a sort of social purpose ecosystem. Like there's lots of people who we work with who kind of want the same thing, whether it's the kelp specialists, whether it's companies like Patagonia or Finisterre, or whether it's, you know, it could be anyone, Surface Against Sewage, we do a lot of work with. We're all in the business of trying to create a more habitable planet and just a better place for people to live. And so I think if you're willing to, to reach out to people and lean into their their audiences and, and enable them to give you the platform to talk about your work, and you can do the same for them, then that gives you that capacity to, to really make the impact that you want to see in the world. Anyone play Minecraft? Yeah? Does anyone see this? Again, this is another bizarre collaboration, but Minecraft reached out, or Love Tropics community, and said, we want to raise some funds for you. Um, we're going to build this entire world about seagrass. So again, Oh, 10 years ago, I didn't think Coldplay would be our patrons. I didn't think Minecraft would be building seagrass meadows. Um, but it's allowing us to reach audiences that we would never have been able to reach with our science. And fundamentally, going back to those problems of seagrass being an ugly duckly, duckling of marine conservation, I think we're now seeing it turn into that beautiful swan because more and more people are aware of its existence. Thank you very much for listening. And if you've got any questions, I'd love to have them.